very first on energy access as a part of MIT Energy Club. So thank you all for coming. Uh, before we get going, uh, I just have uh, one uh, comment on the program. We had uh, a last minute change in one of our panelists. Kathy Zoe is uh, not able to attend. She really wanted to, but because of pressing issues at Sun End, she was not able to. Uh, instead, uh, we got a lot of panelists and Leslie on the last minute, so thank you, Leslie, for that. Uh, the topic we have on the agenda is uh, really near and dear to my heart. I'm Nitin Resh. Uh, I've been in the energy sector for the past eight years and impact investing for the past almost three. And I think uh, the topic for discussion today is really uh, fantastic. Uh, first is the problem. The problem by itself is huge. Today, if you look at uh, uh, the world, more than 1.6 billion people don't have access to energy. In fact, they're spending almost $37 billion every year on kerosene, on candle, just to get basic lighting in their households. And that comes with its own uh, problems. One, it's not healthy. Uh, we have uh, almost 800,000 people who die prematurely because of health reasons, because of uh, uh, getting a, a light from candles or, or kerosene. We, these, are, these solutions are also not very, uh, very clean. They emit almost 300 million tons of CO2 every year in atmosphere. So uh, the problem we have on our hand is huge, uh, it's painful, but I think if you start looking at the trends of uh, where we are going, it is very optimistic. And to get a glimpse, uh, if you look at uh, some of the recent uh, highlights in the sector over the past year or so, we can see where we are and where things uh, will be uh, down the line. Just to uh, pick up some uh, snippets, uh, Bloomberg Energy Finance, they published a report uh, just last month wherein they said that by 2020, people will be spending more than $3 billion a year for solar products to get access to clean energy in developing countries. Along with that, if you look at total amount of investment in the sector in 2015, that was of almost $275 million, which was four times increase compared to what we had back in 2014. Along with that, I think there are some really interesting things happening uh, in the sector. Just to pick up a few, we are seeing large companies becoming really interested in the space because being a part of this equation is not just doing good, but it's also good business. A couple of examples uh, we have on the panel are Total and uh, Solar City. They invested in Offer Electric uh, last year. Then we had uh, Schneider and GDF invested in Phoenix, also in early part of 2015. We are also seeing examples how companies are working to unlock uh, new financing mechanisms in this space. A good example of that is Bbox, which just a couple of months back announced a new financing which was uh, secured by off grid assets in Africa, something which SolarCity has been doing in the US for solar assets for the past almost two years. Uh, we also have new VC money coming into the sector. Angaza went and raised Series A just last fall. So if we start looking at this, I think uh, the trends are really, really optimistic. And what this shows is the innovation is happening not just in hardware space, but also in technology, in payments, uh, in financing. And we have an awesome panel to talk about these themes and more whatever questions you might have on your mind. So I'm really thrilled to have uh, this panelist uh, and this discussion uh, to go deeper into these, uh, these themes. To help us moderate that, we have awesome a moderator. Lisa and Pinkerton. Lisa is a co-founder of Technica Communications, which is one of the premier PR firms in the Bay Area. She's also really passionate about clean tech and a co is a co-founder of Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability. And uh, prior to these organizations, uh, she spent more than a decade in media and PR as a reporter with NPR and uh, PBS, covering sectors like <coughs> energy, healthcare, and bio. So I'm really thrilled. I hope you are too. And with that, I let Lisa in. Take it from here. Thank you very much. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's give the tune a round of applause. And let's also um, thank Sunrun for hosting us, right? Thank you, guys.
I want, I think you all deserve your own round of applause because you can be anywhere tonight and you chose to come here and learn about this topic. So congratulate yourselves. I know, I know staying out late, you know, on a weekday is not always everybody's favorite cup of tea, so really appreciate you being here. Um, before we get started, uh, if you don't already know, ladies' room is down there, men's room is on the other side, and if you could please do us a favor and turn off all your cell phones, or not turn them off, but, you know, mute them, that would be wonderful. If your phone rings, I'm going to want to talk to the person on the other end of the room. <laughs> so don't tempt me. Okay. Uh, before we get started... <laughs> you get one mulligan. That was it. <laughs> All right. So before we get started, we wanted to do a quick poll of the room, uh, just so we can get a sense of um, where everyone's <coughs> coming from, the context, so that we know where we can start the discussion. Um, raise your hand if you're involved in finance. Okay. Great. Thank you. Raise your hand if you're involved in engineering. Okay. About equal to finance. How about marketing, PR, HR, support services like that? Okay. How about sales? All right. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. How many of you are working in the energy sector right now? Okay. That gives you a lot of information. How many are working in off-grid energy? <laughs> How many of you are working in off-grid energy? Okay. Good. You still have something to say. <laughs> and how many of you would like to get into this space? How many of you are looking to get in? Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so we should repoll them after this. <laughs> yes. this is the same <laughs> All right, so we're going to start. I'm going to just do a quick introduction to our amazing panelists. Um, at the far left, stage left, your house right, we have Brian Warshawski. He's the founder and CEO of Phoenix International. He was an early member of the Apple iPod operations team and was an operations lead for the development and introduction of the iPod Mini. He went on to manage the introduction of a number of iPod products and manufacturing processes, as well as co-founding Potenco. He holds an MS in Materials Engineering from MIT. <laughs> and to his right, we have uh, Leslie Marincola. She is the CEO of Enganza. Uh, she put her Stanford product design and mechanical engineering experience towards building Angaza's pay-as-you-go technology, and that can be used with any company looking to sell in the off-grid markets. She was recognized by Business Week as one of America's best young entrepreneurs and is a World Economic Forum Young Global Shaper, as well as was named Forbes 30 Under 30 Entrepreneurs, among, as well as other distinctions. Welcome, Leslie. <laughs> To her right is John Pierce. He's the co-founder and CTO of Off-Grid Electric. He has 15 years of experience in energy efficiency and renewable energy industries, managing energy projects for the U.S. Department of Energy, State of California, and large investor-owned utilities. He began his career in off-grid at the age of seven when his family moved into an off-grid home in the 70s with the Back to the Land Revolution. He lived off of candles and car batteries until the 1980s when he and his father installed a solar home on, a solar system on their house. Uh, he has a degree in construction management and building science from Cal State Chico and a postgraduate education at UCLA. Uh, and he's also a carpenter. Thank you very much, Josh, for being here. And last but certainly not least, we have Sandhya Hegde. She is a general partner at, for the Kosla Impact Fund. And she's both helped uh, fund and build technology solutions for energy education as well as for energy education as, as well as other sectors. Uh, before joining the Coastal Impact Fund, she served at the Sequoia Capital and McKenzie Company. Welcome, Sandy. So, as a way of getting started, we're going to take two or three minutes for each of the panelists to talk about um, their company and what makes them unique. So, Sandia, I'll let you start. Sure. Um, so I run a early stage venture capital fund. We invest in uh, tech startups that are solving very large uh, problems for what we refer to as the bottom 80% rather than the top 20%. And what this means is that when we say, okay, what are problems really relevant to the bottom 80%, we come up with answers, very simple answers like, Energy, finance, education, healthcare. Uh, this is the kind of stuff they're willing to spend money on if there's a good solution and a good service. Um, so we are very active in India and Sub-Saharan Africa. 
uh, we work with, we have a lot of cross-border teams. We have teams that are building technology here in Silicon Valley, in London, uh, in Bangalore, and are looking to work in these markets wherever they find the opportunity. Uh, and given the mandate we have, given the um, uh, problems we are trying to fund solutions for, off-grid energy has been a huge opportunity uh, for us and something that we are very excited about. Um, and when it comes to kind of the investor perspective around this panel, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you might have. Feel free to uh, put us on the spot. Thank you, Sadia. Josh? Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Joshua, CTO and co-founder of Off-Grid Electric. Uh, Off-Grid Electric was founded in uh, early 2012. We've been in the game for a little over four years. Um, and we provide a transformative uh, energy experience through solar energy um, in a pay-as-you-go or a, a lease-financed um, platform. Ours is a more vertically integrated business. We design, manufacture, um, distribute, sell, provide after-sales service for our customers uh, that, that pay us a small upfront fee and then pay us over time. Um, I, I would imagine many folks in the uh, audience are somewhat familiar with uh, the pay as you go. That's a simplification, but you can sort of think about us like Solar City for Africa, but much smaller solar panels. Um, and we are uh, adding about 10,000 customers a month, give or take, and uh, doubling our customer base every six months. Good evening. My name is Leslie. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Angaza. I'm going to build off of Joshua's intro here because we also focus on Pageo technology to make solar financially accessible to off-grid families. Um, but we focus on a single piece of the value chain, the technology development. And we license that technology to third-party manufacturers and third-party distributors. Um, so we work with a very wide range of products, as small as a half-watt solar study lamp, up to large 200-watt and plus solar home systems, and we're starting to look at other product categories that need to be sold at the base of the pyramid and need the same type of financing, like clean cook stoves, solar water pumps, a lot of DC appliances. Um, so basically, there's an embedded technology component of the page geo technology that manufacturers embed into their products to make to meter the energy output, make those products actually talk to the cloud servers. And then there's a software component that's used by distributors, basically as a dashboard for them to register new PayAsYouGo customers and manage their loans over time. So again, we focus on the particular piece of the value chain. Uh, we've got a vertically integrated versus horizontally, sorry, other way around, <laughs> horizontally integrated versus vertically integrated um, PayAsYouGo technology companies represented. Hi, I'm Brian Orzhowski. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and the founder of Phoenix International. Um, I'll go back a little bit further. Uh, a lot of you probably have heard of the One Laptop Per Child project. That organization gave some friends of mine from the Media Lab a grant back in 2006 to figure out how would you provide power to laptops in places without electricity. And I helped found a company to commercialize that technology. It was called Potenko. And we initially were focused on the laptops, and as they kind of changed their technology, and we wanted to find Kind of other opportunities for where our devices could be used. We started studying lighting in Bangladesh and cell phone charging in Uganda with Nokia. And unfortunately, 2008, it was a terrible time to be raising money. I had to shut the company down, but the team really wanted to continue working in the space. And we learned a ton from that first experience. And the outgrowth was Phoenix. And essentially, uh, the intent in 2009 was to provide a tool for entrepreneurs to provide power to their communities through the form of a cell phone charge. And that was kind of how we got started. And fast forward to 2013, we realized that it was going to be really hard to sell a $150 product to a population that didn't have a lot of income per day. And uh, like off an electric, we switched to a pay-as-you-go model. Um, ours is slightly different, where a customer will pay for 18 months uh, at deposit and then small payments uh, daily, weekly, monthly, and then we'll own the device kind of outright after that. Uh, we've sold 60,000 plus kits so far, and we're primarily focused in Uganda, but uh, have also sold in Tanzania and Rwanda. Thank you. You can just hold on to that. Brian, uh, Brian just hold on to that. We'll sure. pass it back the other way. 
the joys of technology in a panel. Um, so uh, Natin gave us a, a really good overview of the space. Um, so we'll just dovetail on that. And I want to ask you, you know, right now, what are you seeing in the space um, in terms of what countries and markets are, are the strongest progressing towards this, um, this model uh, and really getting some good uh, saturation, I think is the word I'm looking for. So from our perspective, it's been really easy setting up, easy is a, a fraught word for this industry, um, but easy-ish uh, to set up operations in Uganda. And mm -hmm. clearly, uh, operations in Tanzania and Kenya have been exploding over the past few years. Um, there's been forays into Nigeria. Obviously, um, Bangladesh has had a program for 30 years working off, essentially off it call has been around for quite some time, not necessarily 30 years, um, getting solar into the hands of customers living off grid. Um, from my perspective, uh, there's obviously tons of opportunity. The limitation is finance and kind of ability to s scale teams into these um, maybe lesser uh, appreciated markets. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in there? Um, yeah, your question was sort of how, how is the, the space evolving? Right. Yeah. How is the space evolving? Um, I mean, we've just seen a tremendous amount of interest explode in the space in the last three years. Um, as I was saying earlier, we couldn't fill a break room four years ago um, talking about energy access and, uh, or five years ago. And, and, you know, and now there's just a huge amount of interest and there's a ton of players in the space as well. Um, internationally speaking, you've got everything from uh, sort of Silicon Valley startups um, through through homegrown enterprises in in each market, um, and as well as, as um, uh, lots of manufacturers from China and abroad um, putting products into the marketplace. So it's evolving tremendously quickly. Um, it seems from the publicity that that means that there's a lot happening, but the reality is that I think in total we've got a few million you know, solar home systems out there and, and maybe 10 or 15 million, I don't know what the number lights. is on, on lights. Um, but, but we have 1.3 billion uh, people still off the grid. So it's really just a drop in the bucket. Um, we're just making a lot of noise right now. Sandhya, from your perspective as an investor, what are you seeing? Can hold the mic close to your mouth. Um, yeah, I think as, as Josh said, um, there is a lot of momentum. Uh, I think you know this. Uh, the whole thing started with folks distributing lanterns, right? Solar lanterns were around for tens of years, and it was really people figuring out how to have great teams, operating processes, use mobile money, uh, structure a payment as you go or a lease rather than asking for money upfront. It was all these kind of operating um, operating process innovation that that created a product that has now started scaling. And I remember one, when, when we made our first investment in 2013, um, I was on this panel and I was saying, you know, this is just the beginning. Like the whole industry has raised less money than Snapchat. <laughs> and, and last year, you know, I think there were more than, there's more than $250 million of capital commitments that went into the space, which is, you know, many multiples of growth year on year, so it's exciting, but it's still less money than what Snapchat has raised. So I think that's a perfect analogy for where we are. We are going fast, but the problem is humongous, and, you know, it's just, we, we're, we're nowhere near saturation. There might be, like, a couple of villages that are saturated, but on a macro scale, uh, there are still so many barriers that need to be surmounted for uh, people to go in, invest money and energy and their lives and build scalable uh, uh, companies, right? So, uh, like I think these folks uh, mentioned, there are pockets of sub-Saharan Africa where there is enough stability of the economy, there are local banks, there's enough of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. So, you know, East Africa, Nigeria, that uh, people are able to go set up these companies. The same is true for India, Bangladesh, Cambodia, uh, parts of Latin America. Uh, but there are still vast tracts of, um, especially Africa, I think like if you take the Congo, it's all dark. People, even people who have cash don't have access to energy. So it's a long way to go and we are very optimistic about 
um, the capacity of the industry to become, you know, this as big as banking and telecom is in, in these markets. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Let's hold on to that. <clears throat> Thank you. So it's so it's, it's like we're almost just scratching the surface here of what's possible, and we'll talk a lot about what some of those challenges are that that are that have us still scratching the surface of the potential. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about pay as you go, so everybody has a, a good sense of, of these solutions. Um, you know, how do they work, and what benefits beyond supply and energy do they provide? Leslie, do you want to take that? Sure. Also, what are the, some of the risks involved? Sure, sure. Um, so I think it's important to first differentiate pay-as-you-go solar from traditional microfinance. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with traditional microfinance, but um, they are giving loans to small businesses or families uh, in cash up front. With pay-as-you-go, what you're doing is you're essentially financing a physical asset, a solar home system, over some period of time. Um, and traditional microfinance, really, there's a minimum loan size that microfinance institutions tend to go. And a lot of the solar home system cost actually falls below that minimum loan size. Um, so we're talking solar loans as small as $15 up to several hundred dollars. And that's still beyond, or still below the sort of minimum low size of microfinance of $1,000. So pay as you go, um, it comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. Um, I think it's important to understand that there is a technology component embedded inside of the solar product, which allows it to meter energy output. Uh, the customer actually prepays for a certain amount of energy or a certain period of time, and the product operates for what the customer is prepaid for, and then it deactivates once that prepaid amount has been consumed or the time has elapsed. And that's the key, we call it technical enforcement, that's the key that gets the customer to continue to repay or else their product doesn't actually work. It's exactly the same as buying prepaid minutes on a cell phone. So the other piece of pay as you go, which I think is less understood, is the software system that has to power the payments, process the payments, collect customer data, enable distributors to know who they've sold to and track repayments over time, or else they're not going to have a sustainable business if they're not selling to enough customers and not getting a high enough repayment. Um, so these kind of software dashboards and data collection features are super important. Um, this might manifest itself as, again, a software dashboard in the headquarters of a distributor. And there's also typically a mobile app component used by sales agents in the field or local retail stores that are actually doing that sale to the end consumer. And those local retailers or local sales agents are really the first line of defense for teaching that end user how to use the technology, how to use the solar system, and how to repay over time. And uh, PHGO companies are starting to equip uh, that part of the value chain, those sales agents, with technology as well. Um, so part of the risks, I mean, you can, you can probably guess, um, basically with PHGO, someone's got to finance that solar home system as the end user repays. And if we're talking about the off-grade market, the majority of end, end consumers are unbanked. They have no credit history. Um, microfinance institutions probably won't take a risk on them, even if they were getting loans that small. Um, so basically, pay as you go distributors have to take a risk on a customer um, and assume that customer is going to repay on that product. Um, so you're seeing pay as you go companies tackle this in various ways. Some are selling pretty low value products, building up a credit history over time on repayment of that low value product, and then upselling the customer to a higher value product after they have some confidence in that, in that in the consumer. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, um, but I, I think really what Pageo technology is also enabling is the collection of data, customer data, product usage data. It's creating a long-term relationship with the customer, whereas traditionally in this industry, uh, most of the companies have been selling a cash-based product and they never see that customer again. So it's, again, a single transaction rather than a long-term relationship. And Pageo is really changing, changing that game. Thank you. Anybody else have anything else to add to that? How do you add to that? <laughs> I, uh, so you talked about a lot of these. Uh, so first I want to have one point of context. You said that these um, systems can start at $15 and go up to, what did you say, $100? Several hundred dollars. Several hundred dollars. In the case of off-grade, it's even more than that. So. Right. So in the context of people who live in these um, emerging markets, how, what does that equate to their their daily spend or their weekly spend, so that we have a sense of what these are costing? Sure. You want to start? And <laughs> pass it around. I've been talking a lot. Sure. 
Um, so we originally looked at pricing the products to match their kerosene spend, and in Uganda we originally started pricing I think around 33 cents, and FX is something we'll probably talk about, so exchange rates. Um, over the past year in Uganda, the exchange rate has um, depreciated significantly, so it's now on the lowest end, gets maybe about 24 cents per day that they're paying. And uh, depending upon um, kind of the income level of the customer, it could be a much bigger system and be more expensive. It just depends on what kind of what level to get their money. So what is what is 25 cents by you? Um, so for us, uh, I mean, like like a loaf like a loaf of bread or. So you know. essentially it's a day's worth of kerosene for lighting of your house and in our instance it would be in exchange for that same amount you would have two or three lights in your house for say eight hours of the day and potentially uh, ability to charge one or two phones and, and then as you pay a little bit more you might have a radio and eventually a TV as you're kind of moving up the, the value chain. I'd say it's like the emotional equivalent of buying your first car. Like you, you know, you're 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 trying to buy a nice, reliable Honda, and you need to pay for it over three years. Okay, it's that's the emotional equivalent. That's how big it is for them, even though it's a hundred dollar system in terms of like landed cost for the company. And I, I can see how um, moving off of kerosene, just even in a small way, can be very motivating for people. That they want to move up that energy access ladder once they start to see the benefits, and they. You know, They'll, they'll find, and I also talk about a little bit about um, some of the, I hear that some people uh, start businesses, like mobile charging businesses and those types of things once they um, have a system. Yeah, um, yeah. I think actually before I, I'll, I'll address that question, but I think it's important to frame up for the folks in the audience who, who maybe haven't spent time in country, um, really the problem that, that we're solving, because it, it's, 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 both a very, uh, it's both a very visceral problem and, and almost an existential problem at the same time. Um, so, you know, when, when we talk about exchanging kerosene for solar energy and, and the leapfrog that, that that implies and the transformation in life experience, it's hard to, it's hard to really grok what that means. So, uh, you know, a, a kerosene lantern will produce about 30 lumens of light, which is barely enough to read by if you're right next to the lantern. Um, and, uh, and the average solar home system with three lights will produce roughly three, 300 lumens of light. So 10x the amount of light of a kerosene lantern for roughly the same price. Um, and not for four or five hours a day, but for up to eight hours a day or more. Um, and, and that's just for lighting. That doesn't include having to walk two or three kilometers and pay somebody an additional 25 cents to charge a single cell phone, which might last you for a day or two before you have to go back. And this is your lifeline. This is now your connection. 80% plus of the people in, in East Africa have a cell phone, um, and, and yet 15% of them actually have a place to charge it. I think it's an important to sort of frame up this, the severity of the discrepancy or the, or the transformational impact of going from having kerosene or candles um, or a flashlight with some cheap Chinese batteries to having electricity in your house. Um, and and I, I think with respect to what you're saying, a lot of what we're seeing now in the marketplace has evolved tremendously from three or four years ago when the aspiration was to go from a, from a, a solar lantern that was 10 or 15 dollars to um, to a solar home lighting system that could actually you could actually sort of semi wire your house and now we're seeing just a rapid evolution in the demand in the marketplace people want more they got a taste of what <laughs> the good life could be and they want more of it and they're prioritizing it they they want to be able to have radios they want to be connected to the rest of the world through televisions and and through through music and entertainment and news um, this is vital to them and but this is awful, often difficult to pay for so one of the ways that we have been innovating is trying to find ways for people to generate income from these systems um, so a, a five port phone charger can generate enough income to pay for your system over a month simply by having your neighbors who maybe can't afford a system and just have a solar lantern or still on kerosene haven't yet taken the jump um, into solar energy can come and charge their cell phones off of clean energy instead of a diesel generator or, or some big car battery or something like that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we had uh, recently in the news, 
there was a, an article uh, by Sky Power who they took some flack for announcing that they would give away two million free solar lighting and charging kits in Ken to Kenya schools, hospitals, and uh, households without access to power. And this is a, an initiative with the Kenyan government. <clears throat> um, but so, but it, but there's also some tension around um, companies who are working in the space where they feel like uh, giving away product isn't the smartest thing to be doing. So on one hand, you have governments who support product giveaways, and on the other hand, you have an industry that often doesn't support that. So it seems like there's a tension here. Can you talk to that, and, and, and what do you, how do you see this playing out of the market? I think we're all going to want to comment, so I'm going to start. We rehearsed this one, <coughs> so you know, should expect great answers from us. Um, <laughs> So the, I think what people don't fully understand about um, giveaway and charity in general is that it works really well with what one would call consumables. If you give away food, you know, shelter to refugees, medicines, malaria kits, shampoo, like it, that, that works. But you give away something that needs customer education, maintenance, uh, warranties, no one gives that stuff away, right? No one says, yes, here's you know, two million free solar lighting kits and five years of free service because uh, in four months you'll be confused about why it's not working and you'll have no one to call. So the problem with the giveaways if, when it comes to stuff like water pumps or um, you know, the solar products is that nobody has a good plan for how they are going to help the, cost, the person who receives it, the beneficiary, actually use it for five years. And that, that is far more expensive than giving away something that you have that no one else is buying. So you know, forget sort of the uh, capitalist um, concerns you might have about like spoiling the market and all of that, it's just, for the customers, it doesn't end up being a confidence-inspiring experience. Um, so I think there are some things you have to give away, and then there are some things where if you are really giving them away, you should give them away with a long-term commitment of actually helping people use it. And I don't, I'm not sure they're doing it the right way. It's going to probably have a lot of negative unintended consequences. Thank you. Our very first off-grid village, uh, when we first started the company, had a, a nonprofit organization that had been donating solar energy systems for four or five years. Um, and the, the village was littered with solar systems and, and solar panels on houses, um, locked up with secure cages to avoid theft and things like that. Um, and, uh, and, and nobody had confidence in solar because somebody had come in and put solar systems in people's homes and then walked away. And there was no after sale service, there, there was no maintenance of the systems, and there were no warranties on the systems, nowhere for people to turn when the systems stopped working. And I know solar energy is an amazing technology, but it's still power electronics and, and electrical cables. Rats like to chew through them and things like that. Um, so we had to overcome a really big barrier uh, to the adoption of our technology because people didn't believe in solar. And this kind of activity will set us back a decade or more um, in terms of, uh, you know, this also happened in South Africa over a decade ago. And uh, so it, it will set us back in that respect. So it's kind of adding on to uh, Sanjay's very good points. Anybody else want to weigh in? I think the only other thing I would add, uh, we are all for-profit companies and we had the choice at the founding to be a nonprofit or a for-profit, we chose to be a for-profit company, and it's in part to be sustainable and to be able to provide the support over the lifetime of the customer having the product. Um, I would say, I might say we're a little biased, but yeah, spoiling the market actually I think is an important um, problem with this, and uh, when we were originally getting started, we saw um, merry-go-round water, merry water pumps as something that philanthropists had installed in villages and same thing after a few months, years, nobody had a sense of ownership of that product so they didn't take care of it and therefore uh, broke down and it, there was nobody to fix it. So I think from our perspective, uh, we would like to see these types of ideas maybe focus more on food, but in reality, uh, the food market, the food economy gets destroyed if you're 
bringing in lots of food. So there's there's risks to any of these kind of donation programs. Okay, thank you. Just the, my last point on that is we've generated a thousand jobs over the last four years. These are sustainable jobs where people are giving being given the opportunity to have their per, per, first professional experience. Um, we built an academy to train the people so they could have their first professional experience. Giving away two million solar lights isn't going to generate jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, I could ask questions all day long, but I find that the questions um, asked from the audience are always far more interesting. So uh, we're going to open it up. I'm going to ask one more question here, and I'll open it up to all of you. Um, because we have to be mic'd and we only have one mic, you may have noticed, come stand over here and form a line if you want to ask a question, and then I will get you the mic so that you can ask the question. Sound good? All right. So start, start you thinking. You can just shout from where you are. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, before we get into the question and answers, I have so many good questions, but I want to say it's so hard to pick one. Um, but let's go with um, this is, you know, is this still largely an impact uh, philanthropic driven industry or is there enough evidence of real return for mainstream investors to start moving in? You know, I, I think I think a lot of my peers and definitely all of these guys would love to say no, it's not and there is enough evidence. But the, my, the reality is that um, commercial investors are only really beginning to take this seriously um, as they rightfully uh, should because it's only now that the industry has the capacity to absorb and deploy large amounts of capital. Right? They've, they've needed more equity and more seed money from the beginning. There has never been enough of that. Uh, and I think that's where the impact investors have played a good role and continue to kind of push forth uh, more companies that they believe in and where the innovation is strong. And the biggest difference between, um, I would say, commercial investors and us is not kind of the um, not the return threshold. I think the energy industry in emerging markets offers really strong returns. You don't even need the kind of tax equity subsidy structures the U.S. market had because energy outside is really expensive. You know, though you don't have to compete with um, uh, the grid with crutches. You can just compete without. So it's not the returns issue. The issue is around risk. And you know, I, I know you have great questions around currency depreciation, for example, right? So these are markets that are more risky, they are small, they are volatile, and they represent a significant barrier to entry, right? If you have a fund that's, for example, done uh, energy projects in Canada for 20 years, the amount of nervousness, even though they are experts in solar, they are so nervous about the idea of investing in an African solar installer because the market is completely different. So uh, the difference between, I think, impact investors like us who are for profit is that, and them, is that we've spent the last five years in these markets. So we feel confident about the risks. We feel that the risks are priced in. And, and we are now at a point where there's enough information that everyone can price that risk and enter this market. Uh, and that's the story that we are going out sharing with commercial investors. And, and this year, we see some of them buying that story. So hopefully, that number will keep increasing, and, and these companies will have enough oxygen to scale. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in here? Um, I'll, I'll just say that no large-scale infrastructure economy or, or industry ever reached scale without serious help and, and often subsidization. Uh, Edison had a huge amount of government support in order to create the first electrical grid in the United States. Um, the, the telecom industry in, in Africa, and in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, had a huge amount of support to do what they did, which was provide uh, communications, access to communications for 90% of Africans. Um, so, you know, the reality is that doing anything this big, this kind of infrastructure, is going to require support. And uh, the commercial investors that have invested in this space have been the visionaries, they've been the people willing to put a bid on the line because they believe in the vision, because that they recognize um, and they see the potential for it. But you know, they're, the, they're the brave ones. The, they, there are no unicorns in this space yet. Excellent. So I saw someone raise their hand. Do you want to ask your question? Just stand up and speak loudly. Yeah. Hi, I'm Neka. Um, 
The reason why a lot of your businesses have been able to succeed is because uh, the local society or the government was not able to provide the infrastructure needed to power the people. Is it your anticipation that the infrastructure and the grill, the grid, will expand so that you can plug in your products? Or are you expecting that the markets will stay off the grid and independent the way that the telecom has been mobile rather than cable? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think one misnomer about the term off-grid, um, an off-grid family, for example, is you can be off-grid and live directly under a power line. And it costs about $400 to bring power just right down to your house. Um, so in some cases, people are just tapping into the power line and stealing that power. Um, but that is absolutely an off-grid family that's considered part of the 1.2 billion people in the world who live off-grid and can benefit from distributed solar. So the, the short story is the, the off-grid population is growing much faster than grid extension, and the unit economics of distributed solar just make that much more sense than grid extension. Uh, the other thing that you see kind of beautifully exemplified in India where grid extension actually succeeded, like most people are connected to the grid, whether they are stealing it or they have a license or whatever, but the grid capacity is very limited, right? So my um, aunts and uncles who, st uh, who are still in our ancestral villages, like they have a grid connection. It only works four hours a day or maybe six hours a day. And that's because the whole country doesn't have enough supply. Even if they had one beautiful, efficient, centralized grid, they would channel most of it towards industry and urban India and leave and the rest of India would kind of get what they can get. So we are so like in terms of like demand and supply gaps, there's the gap is so huge that even if there is uh, advances made by everybody participating right now, if the government did extension, increased supply, all of the off-grid companies put more system in, systems in, microgrids, houses, home kits, whatever there would still be unmet demand for like more than 10 years. It's just, I think the scale of the problem is very easy to miss, right? So in India, I think about uh, outside of the main major cities, uh, anyone who has a grid connection, if they can afford it, they still have a backup diesel generator. And if they have a roof, they, will, they are happy to consider putting up solar. So it, you have to remember it's not just the problem of whether there's a copper wire that ends up at your house. It's also the question of whether the country has enough being generated to begin with. And I don't think that's a problem that will be solved in even the next 20 years. These, all these countries are extremely hungry for electricity. Any which way you give it to them, whether it's coal or solar, that's a secondary issue. They really just want the electricity. They don't care if it's clean or not right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. Who else has a question? I saw this gentleman here. Uh, so my question is a reaction to one of your comments earlier. So it's not yet. Uh, you said how um, uh, there are a lot of uh, significant barriers to scaled projects. Um, a lot, uh, uh, and a lot of that is because of um, process innovation that's still required down the road. So my question to the group is, you know, what are some of those highest barriers to scale <coughs> projects, and is there sort of an industry consensus, particularly in East Africa, around how to overcome those barriers? What are the most difficult parts of your job? <laughs> <laughs> outside of fundraising. Right, outside of fundraising. It's a great question. Um, I would say at this point, most of the you know, the technical part of creating a solar home system and getting it to a point of distribution, we essentially solved that. Getting it to an end customer and into their house is, right now, it's, it's still a challenge. There aren't populations that really understand solar, and so there's education. There, we're, for the most part, using mobile money, so there's education on how to use mobile money, because a lot of the population who's buying one of these has never used mobile money in the first place. So there's a fairly significant education component that it's, it's an added cost to a company like ours, um, and maybe something that uh, in most other industries you wouldn't necessarily have. So I would say that that is one. 
Uh, and then another challenge that I would say we face, uh, you go into there's 40 languages, so if you go to our call center, you hear 27 different languages being spoken, and it, it just sets, everything is more complicated. Um, and so I would love to say that there are ways that we will make that easier, but the truth is it's just gonna be a more complicated business than, say, selling iPhones in California. Um, I would add we're kind of a biased panel in the sense that we represent sort of a branded um, part of the, the industry. But over half of the solar products sold in off-grid markets have been in this unbranded category. And a large part of that includes counterfeit products that may not be high quality. Um, and this has gone on for, for years, far before these like branded quality certified products entered the market. Um, so there's still absolutely a large trust in solar issue. Pay-as-you-go is helping to get around that because families now have to invest a much smaller amount to adopt a high quality solar product, but it's absolutely still there. I mean, you look at the unit economics of a solar product and it's a total no-brainer. Of course you're gonna pay for solar rather than continue to purchase kerosene. It's better in every way. Um, so why isn't every single family adopting it? Some have been burned by, by pretty crappy solar products on the market in the past. Um, I'll just make one point. Uh, there's, of course, many things you could say about barriers to, to scale. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we're a, a more vertically integrated business is because when we showed up, we thought we'd partner with people to help with the distribution or to help with sales or to help with after sales service and, and technical support um, or to help with a call center. And the reality in Sub-Saharan Africa is many of these things don't exist. Or if they do, they only serve the top 5% of the population. And so to actually build infrastructure that can support a scaling organization is incredibly challenging. Um, you're, so you're trying to build academies and a call center and learn how to be a customer service organization as well as a technology and sales organization. Um, but you're also trying to do that with your investors' dollars who want to see a return on their investment. Um, why you try and build a marketplace. So it really is about building the marketplace. Thank you. Yeah, I think what people don't realize is that the even the really young startups in this in this space, they don't have the luxury of being specialists in one thing. You have to do everything. You can't, you know, I think Stripe is a beautiful example, right? They are this really thin, beautiful layer in the whole ecosystem of like mobile e-commerce transactions. And all they have to do is have an elegant solution for the payments problem. And these companies, even when they are six months old, have to be multinational companies that are manufacturing or at least getting product that they have designed shipped from, say, China. They have to figure out how to get it through customs in an African port, which, by the way, none of you mentioned, one of the most complicated things to learn. They have to figure out what licensing to get for their products. They have to help the local government come up with the licensing for the product because they are like, we don't know what to call these your solar systems. This is kind of strange. So they, you have to kind of become experts in 20 different things uh, to get the confidence that you now have a smoothly working system and you will not discover new problems. In terms of kind of systemic issues, I would say on in the finance side, lack of existing credit history for customers and uh, currency fluctuations are very you know macro problems that no one has real solutions for. We are all kind of hoping it doesn't kill us and praying that someone will come up with elegant ideas as we grow. Um, and then ar around sort of the operation side, like they said, it's just it's big, trying to become an expert as a you know small company in all of these different services and training and uh, uh, you know, customer service and not getting to rely on third party or partners for anything is a fairly big barrier. And it's true for off-grid everywhere because the leading companies in the space are the first ones to do what they are doing in every market. You so get me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I saw a hand over here, yeah. Um, Stand up and, oh, and speak loudly, please. Uh, because you're all for-profits, I would like to know what you think the role of a non-profit should be in this industry. What's the role of a non-profit in this industry? I'll speak to that. 
Um, so because we work exclusively through third party distributors, we work with a lot of nonprofit distributors um, who have actually made the transition from an initial giveaway model for solar products to a sales model um, to create a more sustainable business that can, that can scale um, faster. Um, so basically, the, the big difference we see between nonprofit and for profit distributors is that nonprofit distributors tend to be much more trusted in the communities they work in um, and have a stronger brand because of that and are more successful because of that. Um, that's a huge generalization that I'm making, um, but that's definitely something we tend to see just because they've been working in those communities for so long. Thank you. I'd say one of the complaints that folks might have is that all of the companies that are being run doing off-grid power are generally not run by local uh, Ugandans or Kenyans. And one of the, I would say, the biggest opportunities for nonprofits is training and education and getting skilled people uh, writing software or learning how to do electrical engineering and being able to do repairs in country and kind of growing as we grow into running these types of companies. That's excellent. Okay, how about you, sir? Yes, uh, my question has to do with uh, production uses of energy, and I myself have used. You speak up, please. Stand up. And speak we'll repeat the question. Yeah, I'll repeat okay. the question. Actually, I have a deep voice. <laughs> <laughs> so my question has to do with productive uses of energy, and I myself have used a lot of solar home systems in Ghana in the last few years. My parents are big fans because even though we have the grid connected, half of the time it doesn't work. So people at home are fighting to see who, who can use what in what room. Okay, so the, the, the issue becomes this. There's a huge part of the population that does business activities and they all suffer from lack of reliable power. So there's access and there's reliability. These are two big problems. And according to the EIA, even with all that we are doing, by 2040, 500 million people will still not have access to power. And they've identified mini grids as a big part of the solution. However, it doesn't look like anybody is doing it really well. Why haven't you guys looked into that? And if you have, why haven't you done anything about it? And what would it take for these solutions to come to market? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she, she knows me from before. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great question. Th thanks for your question. Uh, I, productive use is absolutely um, a challenge, and it's a big challenge, and, and it's one that doesn't have a lot of easy answers um, because of the scale of it uh, and because of the economics of it. Uh, with with respect to mini grids, you know, I I think I vacillated back and forth. Um, the the reality today is that um, mini grids are challenging from an economic perspective. It costs about a thousand dollars to connect a household to uh, a microgrid. So the microgrid, just for, for folks who aren't speaking the lingo, um, think of it from uh, maybe a kilowatt up to, could be up to 100 kilowatts. Uh, think of that as a microgrid. It's, it's very specific, it's very centralized, it's typically within one community, and, and it has a, a, a limitation, physics-based limitations to the amount of people it can connect and how far it can go. Then you have mini grids, which are larger, sort of megawatt-sized projects where you're com where you're connecting a whole town or multiple towns, um, and that's typically run through either a very large solar farm, pretty rare, more uh, realistically a one megawatt or two megawatt GE generator that's run off of diesel or, or some other fossil fuel. Um, and especially in the microgrid space, which is something that a lot of folks, including the, the panelist who wasn't uh, able to come tonight, are working on. And, and I admire them uh, for working on it because I think there's a real symbiotic relationship that can happen between large grids, microgrids and mini grids, and distributed solar. It's, we're a long way away from that. Um, and there are a lot of technical challenges around it. But the, the simple fact is that at the moment, uh, it needs even more subsidization. So $1,000 to connect a household, and they're gonna pay you somewhere between four and $20 a month for their electricity on average. Um, so you know, hats off to the people that are working on it, um, but we just got a long way to go. I think um, where the government is getting very actively involved in subsidizing and giving kind of a stable environment for microgrid startups to flourish, it could be you know, cheap debt, it could be um, 
proper licenses to operate as the licensed utility provider, which means that you won't have competition from other mini grids in the village, right? There, there are a lot of ways that the government can help make a mini grid happen, um, or if the or if the market just matures, right? So. There's, uh, there, there are some pockets and markets where it, it works. So Bangladesh is a great example. Bangladesh probably, from the data that I have, has the highest penetration of microgrids and mini grids in the off-grid uh, solar space. They have a couple of big things working in their favor. One is the density of the population. Bangladesh is dense as hell. It's like worse than India. But what that means is if you are a microgrid, the cost, the economics kind of start working out. You don't have to put copper wire for like multiple kilometers to reach that one guy who's in the middle of a field. They're all clustered together. You can find 20 customers in a fairly manageable distance. Uh, and the government will give you uh, funding at 6% because they've been doing this for 20 years and it's a mature market for solar finance. So there are some indications that maybe my, the, the shift to microgrids is just a market maturing. And it's possible that a lot of these markets that we are in, some of the pockets, the ones that are dense, will naturally move someday from, e from uh, using uh, rooftop systems and dedicated systems to microgrids. Uh, and some of them will start getting, you know, uh, depending on the, um, uh, the income levels, they could get microgrids or there, there could be a mini grid that makes more sense. But it needs a much more mature market than is available to uh, most people who are in this field right now. So, you know, hopefully it's a question of time and I think all of these can uh, coexist. And the US market is a great example of how, right? All you need is a, 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 an environment where you can uh, just do net metering, right? So you can have a microgrid, you can still have your own panels, you can have the government grid, you will still be hungry for elect more electricity, and all you need is an environment that allows for net metering for all of these business models to coexist very happily. So that's kind of the future we are all angling for and lobbying for. And, we are, and, and, and I'm sure pretty much everyone agrees that from a technical standpoint, microgrids are more efficient. And right? it's much more efficient in terms of like, kilowatt hour pricing and usage, but no one is purchasing energy based on kilowatt hour pricing in these markets. They're saying, how many hours of light and television and radio can I get? Not, you know, what's the kilowatt hour rate? So it's just so early in the evolution that we will all have to wait a little more for that time when selling a microgrid will be easy. I think there's also the challenge of um, people are beginning to see solar and small solar home systems as, uh, as um, a product that they want to own. It's an investment in their house. Um, it's sort of like adding on a room, if you will. It's a long-term investment. And once it's paid off, the energy is free. So when, when you're looking at that, and their energy needs are still very basic. So I agree with everything Sandhya said, but, um, but I would also say this is something that is unique in off-grid markets that you don't see in mature markets that have centralized energy infrastructure is that people begin to see this as a part of their the ownership of their home. We don't think about energy uh, owning our energy. Maybe the, the, the few of us that can afford or that have signed up for Solar City, okay, cool, in 20 years, you know, I could potentially go off-grid or something like that. I think that'll accelerate here, but that's an area where actually Africa is going to set the tone and is going to set a precedent. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ron. Uh, so this dates me a little bit, but in the 60s, I worked in the United States with unbanked communities. Um, and 30 years ago, I was at a meeting right here at the Federal Reserve about digital cash, which no one really wanted to accept here in the United States, and we're a bit behind. So I wanted to talk about the payment side and whether or not you see mobile cash and the ability to do mobile payments or digital cash as transformative beyond individual needs for energy but really uh, transforming villages and societies uh, to start thinking a bit more about finance, about savings, uh, and the like. I've mean, just been fascinated by the transformative aspects of digital cash, especially in these unbanked uh, regions of the world. Thank you. Leslie? Sure. 
Um, so absolutely it's transformative um, because basically at the end of the day it's giving a use case, an immediate use case to use mobile money is make your solar payment by the day or by the week. Um, and uh, in, in markets where mobile money has really penetrated the majority of the adult population, um, it's, there are not a lot of active um, users because they don't have a frequent, consistent reason to use it. It might be more of a, hey, I need to send money home, I'm using it um, you know, several times a year. Um, I would say, though, that uh, we work with both mobile money and cash in terms of how our distributors transact and collect solar payments over time. And mobile money is still very challenging um, because um, there's a difference between making a consumer-to-consumer -consumer mobile money payment versus a consumer-to-business mobile money payment. It's a completely different user interface on the phone. Um, and so still distributors are doing a lot of consumer education to get users to adopt mobile money. Um, and really, outside of Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, um, it's, it's a pretty uh, losing, losing battle um, to try and assume that your, your solar consumers will be able to transact exclusively with mobile money for that solar product. Is there a role for governments in that? Um, absolutely. I would say there's more of a role for telecoms to really um, push it on, on sort of the private sector. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot of new, interesting, exciting um, products out there that are using mobile money and, and mobile data to help people build credit histories, access traditional financial <laughs> services, save money um, through a mobile app. Um, and, and that's becoming more common, but it's still, there, there's a long way to, to go. Anyone else want to jump in? Okay, we have time for about three more questions, so hold your hand up high if you really want to ask it. Yep. <laughs> question for, my name is Jane Olivia. Speak up, please. Question for Joshua. Um, just back to the microgrid question. Um, I was listening to a presentation from Nancy Tun, one of your investors from the Young Partners, and she mentioned that OGV would be, there was a plan to get into microgrid, so question one, I'd like to get your input of, do you see, if you foresee that, as an area of strategy for OGE. And the second question is related to um, your model, your business model. So do customers at the end of, say, paying for the unit, own the unit, or do they pay a monthly service in perpetuity over the course of five, six, seven, ten years? In which case, they pay more than what the actual unit is. I'm looking at my chief of staff here to see what I can tell you and what I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, if Nancy says we're doing it, I guess that's that's it. Um, <laughs> we're going for microgrids. Uh, I, I think what Nancy was referring to is is the. I, I think we would we we've always thought of ourselves as a very innovative company, kind of a risk taking company, um, sort of trying to be trailblazing and and looking at new opportunities. And so a lot of folks have these kind of. Uh, intellectual debates in the energy access industry about does microgrids make sense, do minigrids make sense, where's the economics and and you know of course we have arm wrestling contests between us and that sort of thing but the reality is that we would like to be the first ones to partner up with a, a microgrid organization um, and, and, and experiment with a distributed and microgrid rollout in a village, in a community or in a region um, because there are realities to microgrids. They can only go so far. You need the kind of density that Sanjay was talking about to make the economics even close to work. Um, and you also need to have the right income levels within those communities. So distributed energy, rooftop solar plus microgrids could be incredibly transformative both from a business standpoint because you're going in and you're actually planning your rollout in a community. You're working with community leaders, you're working with the government to do this. Um, and as well as for the communities because rooftop solar gets really expensive when you start getting into productive use. Um, and that's so you really can leverage the kind of anchor tenants, if you will, like somebody with a corn grinding or a, or a milling machine or a welder that really needs that productive use power. And they're likely to be in the village center anyway. So it's, we see it as potentially symbiotic. Second part Anybody of the else question. Want? The second part of the question. Oh, do you shoot. have uh, well, <laughs> payments and do you own the system afterwards or yeah. is there a service component? So we started our business, um, I'll be as frank as I can. Uh, we started our business with a, a solar as a service mindset. That's how we sold our first couple rounds of investment. People want the energy, they care less about, and they need the service. So we will just provide the lowest cost solution with the lowest risk to the customer. Again, we're risk takers. So 
the customer doesn't need to own the system, they just pay us a small fee every month and we amortize the cost of the hardware and the service into that payment and as long as it's valuable to them, they continue to pay. Um, there were some tax issues associated with that and so we turned it into a long-term lease. It was a still effectively, because these products, they, you know, the solar panel might last 20 plus years, even in a harsh environment, but batteries last somewhere between five and 10. We use really, really good quality lithium batteries. We spend more probably on our energy storage than most other companies out there because we want those to last long and we had a 10 year lease. So we were on the hook for that. We couldn't afford to be changing that battery out every three years. Um, what we've seen though, as the market has matured, is people are asking for a faster path to payment. They begin to see this as an investment in their life. And so we've spent a lot of time in the last six months to a year exploring what is the right solution and how can we create flexibility for customers that are farmers that maybe get maybe they make money three times a year. Um, their incomes are very lumpy and very inconsistent. So payment flexibility, a shorter path to ownership, um, and flexibility. That's kind of the, the a special sauce that we can provide. So I can't really say a whole lot more than that, but absolutely when customers want a faster path to ownership, we want to give it to them. Thank you. Okay, two more questions. Raise your hand high. Yeah, right back there. So I'm wondering um, why you guys choose um, certain countries. Um, what makes a particular country a good opportunity or a particularly talented opportunity? Why do you choose certain countries? Sure. So we got started in Uganda in part because we had experience working there with a former company, and in part, um, there was an opportunity essentially to work with Google and the Grameen Foundation, and their community knowledge worker program, and that was kind of our first anchor <coughs> customer. And we knew solving kind of the last mile distribution problem was going to require a significant partner, and we saw the best <coughs> alignment with mobile telecoms, and we had started to build a relationship with both the former company and through the Google Grameen relationship with MTN, Africa's largest telecom. And so we actually brand our product with their logo, we sell it through the points of sale, and it was a way for us to enter the market at a relatively low cost. So that was why you got it. The uh, longer, I think, answer is really, it, it depends on the mobile money rollout for us. The cost of collections is just significantly less if there's just a strong mobile money rollout, and our customers are primarily very rural. And so it needs to be a rollout that extends deep into the rural parts of the country. So that's kind of how we're gauging which countries are appropriate. Anyone uh, else want to chime in? I'll chime in quickly. Um, so we're sort of a different business model. We don't actually choose what countries we work in. Our partners choose what, what countries they want to sell their pay as products in. And our software platform has to work in all those countries. Um, so we work across East Africa, West Africa, India, Latin America. Um, and I would say that the basically local um, solar context in each of these countries is totally different. In some of the countries, you have really good data connectivity at the last mile. In other countries, it's super spotty and you can't even get an SMS to the end consumer. Um, and uh, even the price of kerosene differs massively from country to country. And that's what you ground your solar payments against. Um, so basically all that to say, um, I think that one single solar solution and one single distribution model is never going to work in every country in the world, and it's always going to have to be tweaked, sometimes pretty massively, uh, for different market contexts. And I can, I can sense that um, government stability is also pretty important, right? You're not going to go in and build a market if something's going to happen in five years and all your good work is for naught. And currency risk. As and well. currency risk as well. Okay, good. One more question. Stand up, please. Hi, um, my name is Anna, and I guess um, there's mixed feelings, I guess, when we talk about philanthropy and we talk about helping people and just, you know, assisting people, like what you guys were referring earlier to maybe, you know, nonprofits coming in and, and kind of giving things away. And I mean, this sort of thing of like, we think we're in the, you know, developed world, therefore we have a formula for development that we want to sort of apply to the non-developed world. And, and I personally have mixed feelings about it, but I just kind of wanted to pick your brains about, you know, you bring electricity to communities that didn't have it. Yeah, it's a great thing. I, I'm, you know, if we go back home, like, you know, and can't turn off our lights or can't, you know, use electricity for ourselves, it's probably 
not you know not a great thing and I and I totally understand it but I also know that after you provide electricity there's a lot of services and things and the cultures that people just were not used to so how do you see that from you know your own perspective like you know people that were used to maybe uh, sp spending more time as a family or spending more time in the community now being hooked up to a, a radio or a TV I mean and I'm not saying that always happens but I think there is sort of a trend for that to start to happen, and then you know you mix that with the whole development versus non-development. I don't know. Just like I said, I personally have mixed feelings about it, but I just wanted to pick your brains. So I, I've never had mixed feelings about this. I'll be honest. You know, I come from. I've, I've uh, every summer I lived in our ancestral village when I was not in school, and they had electricity for three or four hours. And it wasn't about TV or like having light to study, not having electricity at 6 p.m. and it's all dark and muggy is horrible. You can't like, I can't go find water to drink. Or if there's a little baby, it might go get bitten by insects and is crying and you don't know what's wrong. Like, I think it's very hard to empathize with the extent of the you know, problem you have to deal with when you don't have light, because none of us have had to live without light. So I've never thought about like, oh, is it spoiling the beautiful untouched culture? And they, and nobody there is thinking that. You know, I, when I first started doing this, I had this, there was this you know, philanthropic investor who said that, who, to, who asked me what, how we study impact, right? And they were kind of coming from the place where you are coming from, which is they said, you know, people keep telling us these lights will help the kids study. And that's why it's so important because these kids can't do their homework in the evening. But I haven't seen any evidence that this is somehow happening. Like our grades improving, like, <laughs> is, it, is it working? And I said, are you saying people don't deserve electricity if they are not studying? <laughs> really, that's, that's the question. Like, don't, we don't have to think so narrowly about something as fundamental as energy. It's transformed everyone's lives when they get it. How they choose to use it is completely their prerogative. And no one, it's no one else's business. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in? Sorry, that was, what, what, what kind of social, what kind of impact, measurable impact, have you seen in these underdeveloped communities, like education, uh, economic, So this is this is a this is more emotional than I usually get. <laughs> it's a better life. It doesn't matter whether the kids are studying or not. There are people who are not dying because there is electricity. There, there, there are people who have more hours of life to live because everything doesn't go black at 6 p.m. It's the, these are not things anybody can measure. It doesn't matter what your impact model is. So this is very, very fundamental. And then, of course, yes, you can say, OK, the lack of kerosene, burning kerosene. You know, most women, like the whole cook stove industry, right? These are women cooking in the dark with charcoal and wood. And it's very hard to measure exactly what the harm being done to their health is. These are not like, I'm an impact investor and I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I can't really measure the impact of this. What is clear to me is that it's transformational and it's worth every single hour of my life that I put into it. But I can't put a number to it. Thank you. I, I have to tell a couple of stories because I love it when I get this question. Um, <laughs> in one of my most recent uh, trips back home uh, to Tanzania, uh, we, we went out to, to see some customers and uh, I was just going around with our, our people to kind of um, see some of the changes we made in our model um, and see how our new product line was working in the field. And I went to a customer's house and they were kind of in a, in a rural area, maybe 10, 5, 10 kilometers from the main town. Um, and the guy had taken our brightest lights and strewn them around the outside of his house. He had two lights inside and three lights outside. And the two brightest lights were on the outside of the house. Um, and you know, he had a kind of a, like a courtyard area, but I couldn't for the life of me figure out what was going on here. So I asked him, I said, why are all your bright lights on the outside and you have your dimmest lights on the inside? 
He said, well, it's been great since I started having Empower, because, which is our, the brand of our, our, our solar product, um, because uh, I haven't lost a single goat or a chicken to hyenas since I started uh, with Empower. And before that, I was losing one a week. So, you know, yeah, yeah, not expected that one. Um, yeah, but. it's not. We can't conceptualize what life without electricity is. We can't conceptualize life without our iPhones. Like, so let's. I can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to think about it. Do you have any other stories uh, that you want to share? That's a great. That's a great story. Do you? You all have stories you want to share of the impacts that you've made. So we have a similar story. There was a customer that was extremely excited about having lights outside. Security lighting is more popular than you would expect. But his happiness about security lighting was that the snakes and I think rats were minimized because they had outdoor security lighting. That they weren't coming into the house as much. Um, there's a ton of stories that we we hear about. I don't unfortunately have any that, that come to mind that are particularly fantastic, but it, it's one of the joys of working in the space is we do hear like, what individual impact we're having on the households, and I'd say that's one of the best parts of this experience. We, we just launched a, a barber shop kit where you can have three lights uh, and, and hair clippers, and you can start your own barber. A very, very common and popular thing. And you go to any village in East Africa, and, and there's, you know, there's a little duka where you can buy toilet paper and soap, uh, and there's typically a place where you, can, where you can eat some food, and then there's a barber shop. And every, it doesn't matter how small the village is. Um, there's some dude there with a car battery and, and a pair of hair clippers giving people cool haircuts. So you'll be measuring impact on hairstyles. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. There's a cool factor. Um, and so th this, guy had, this guy had tripled his income um, because he had started a, a barber shop on the side. Yeah. I'll just say one more thing, kind of to bring it back to your question. Uh, none of us have had to work hard at all to create the demand for these <laughs> markets. I mean, our companies were born because there's this huge latent demand in the off-grid industry for energy and, and, and for the appliances to plug into that energy. Um, and uh, that's something that, that we can't argue with and that you know yeah. we're here to meet. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's almost, uh, there's uh, one um, uh, CTO in the space told me once that you know what inspires him about this whole space is this idea that no one's life trajectory or um, their mobility through life should be impacted because they were born in a region where there wasn't power. <laughs> like, you know, it's not less than three generations where there wasn't power in every region of the United States. Mm -hmm. So if you look historically at this agency called the REA, Rural Electrification Agency, it established the Tennessee Valley Authority to bring electricity to parts of Appalachia and then onto the Ohio River Valley in the 1930s and 1940s. And within my memory, my relatives were in towns that had no electricity. So we think we've come so far, but we're not talking, we're talking less than 75 years or so for which not every community, or I should say the positive, for which finally every community had electricity in the United States. And the same stories are told. That was a government agency when we did big government things back in the 1930s. <laughs> uh, I think if we tried to do it today, we do microfinancing and pay as you go, but that's just okay. the nature of our society. But look up the history of the REA and the TVA. It's very, very fascinating. Barry, thank you very much thank for that you. history lesson. Well, I want to give you all a chance to network with the panelists, so we're going to stop now. Um, let's thank them for all their wonderful insights.